beautiful souls and welcome to another episode of the Life Doula Podcast. I am your Life Doula, Charity Marahomsar, your guide on this journey of compassionate conversations. Today, we're diving into a topic that needs more open dialogue, palliative care for our courageous cancer warriors. Today, I am grateful and deeply honored to have our guest, a medical oncologist by profession, and over the years has spent a lot of time in the hospice and palliative care space. My dear friend, Dr. Sano Ives Tanael. Hello, Doc Ives. Hello, Charity. Before we deep dive into this highly controversial topic, as you know, can you give us a sneak peek of how you got into the palliative care and hospice space? Uh, okay. Medyo mahaba-haba pa i ko. Well, it, it started uh, when I was practicing medical oncology here in the Philippines. Uh, hindi ako makapag-ipo na pasyente, parating namamatay. Uh, so it started getting into my nerves. I said to myself, am I, uh, am I a failure? Am I not good enough? Is there nothing else that I can do? Yeah. So those accumulated, accumulated uh, deaths really uh, questioned myself. Am I really giving the care that I should be given to a patient? And there were several uh, uh, misfortunes and, and family demise that happened that I said, I'm giving up. Wow. So eventually, and there was some lingering guilt in me. So I decided perhaps it's not for me. So I left for, for out of the country. And I think it's divine intervention that at the time I decided I'm, I'm leaving despite my quite successful career already. Uh, uh, there was an opening to go to Canada. Okay. So in Canada, uh, I said I'm not going to be going in practice, but I'm still going to research. Okay. I had a chance to work with research, so I, my focus was evidence synthesis, clinical guidelines. But I think fate was the de uh, destiny is there to keep working with evidence about oncology patients. Okay and creating guidelines. I had a chance to work with many other people. So parang hindi ako binibitawan. Tapos, from there, I, I had some widening of perspectives. Then, pandemic happened. When pandemic happened, I was at the University of Alberta. I was doing research project. And then I had a chance to, to have friends who work in hospice care. So I was already visiting it, but I was observing how they work. So I see patients. Okay. And then I, when I returned, uh, when the pandemic arrived, I had to go back to Toronto where my niece is there. So if, because I knew if it, there's a pandemic, there will be a shutdown. So everything was shut down. Every, all the work suddenly disappeared. So what else can I do? Fortunately, there was this clinic who asked for international medical graduates to assist them in the end. It's a pain clinic. So with the pain clinic, I was exposed to a lot of patients in pain. Many of them are in palliative mode. And then uh, there comes the, after that, there's an opening on uh, called transit care. So it was, it was so interesting because um, I was exposed to managing the nutrition, assisting nutrition. But I went there. The patients are mostly as a, has a rate, has a life limiting illness, which is the subject. Of, yes. And I'm in the nutrition aspect. Okay. So, and, and then slowly I said, am I being led towards this profession? 
And then when I moved to another place, uh, I had some, I went to the, I discovered the church that wasn't served. It's almost always dark. And then I, I said to the girl there, what's happening here? Where are the people? Where are the, where's the priest? There's no mic. What else can I do to help as a, as a devout Catholic? And she said, what's your profession? I'm in the healthcare. So I said, okay, uh, what can I do? Oh, we need a minister for the sick and the homebound. Wow. Ah, okay, what shall I do? So I had to talk to the priest, give me some training. And then when I started, do, so the ministry of the sick and the homebound, after the Sunday Mass or after every Mass, uh, it's like an extension of the Mass. The Holy Eucharist is blessed and you go to the sick or to the terminally ill or the frail elderly and then you have some prayers and then you give the Eucharist. And that caused me to study a lot again. Uh, on, on, on preparation of that. So that's when I encountered St. Joseph who turned out to be the patron of the sick, the, the terror of man. demons. And then I encountered there the divine mercy. And then there's again a rejuvenation of my devotion to the Holy Spirit. And I said, oh my God, this is what I'm missing. This is what I really need to do. Because I have be always been looking at the patient from the point of view of what a doctor can do within the science of medicine and the arts. So I said, so it was a discernment journey. And, said, wow. and so I decided, then I asked for a decision. I said to the, I've been asking, because that time I almost was a candidate to be a deacon. <laughs> because I was so close to the church, they asked me. And there were a lot of hurdles. But when I asked the feasibility of going back here and go for palliative, they didn't know that I'm into palliative medicine, I really want. Both are going on in parallel. I said, what will decide? Cut the story short. At the time wherein I had difficulty deciding, the, the registrar of the seminary called me up, was, was so apologetic and said to me, you know, we really love you to be here, but you see, by by uh, by qualification, you're more than a year than that to be accepted. Meaning to oh, say, okay. I'm more than one year already. So I was 61 at that time. The Catholic oh. 60. I said, is it the Catholic Church? <laughs> Aren't we going to have age limit in, in Canada? That's not allowed. You see the Catholic Church always always late in changing their their rules. Their rules. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And then I and he was apologetic. No, no, no. You solved my decision. I'm so happy about it because now I know. So you were led to a decision because of that ruling. To that choice yeah. that uh, I did not choose because I was rejected on that. Because at the time, I had to make a choice. I couldn't make a choice. I said, bahala ka na sa taas. Okay, so that's an interesting journey. It is a, a journey. medical oncologist, and then we all know that doctors are really into research. And somehow, I think I believe that when God is really leading you into a path, He will do everything, right? To make mm -hmm. sure that you are redirected to that path. Very interesting. Now, as we promise, this is going to be a very informative, thought-provoking episode. But you and I know there's a whole gamut of myths, you know, yung mga kuro-kuro <laughs> and misconceptions around palliative care. Could you mention at least three? And I can help you with the first, and you and I have, have spoken about this, the myth that palliative care is given only to the dying. <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. The palliative care, from the definition alone, we can demystify everything. Palliative care is uh, an approach in caring for patients. These patients uh, have life-limiting illness. The purpose of which is to enhance quality of life. So who are the patients with life-limiting illness? It's not all about cancer. Anyone who's, who has been diagnosed that their life is limited, 
there is no cure, it's progressive, and it's irreversible. Okay. At the, it's irreversible at the current state of medicine. So who are these? Advanced and cancer patients, those with heart failure, those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, those with uh, end-stage kidney disease, those with complicated HIV and AIDS, those with frail, that are even frail elderly, frail those that are uh, uh, at the advanced stage of Alzheimer's, dementia, etc. In short, they're not dying. Okay. Once you're diagnosed with that, with an end limit, with a life-limiting illness, that's already should be the start of palliative care. So we will qualify this. Palliative care is not given only to the dying, right? So that, that's very clear. Can you have another, can you share with us another myth or uh, another misconception about palliative care? Another misconception of palliative care is it's um, hospice care. You're only put there. Uh, when you do go to hospice care, you're dying. Well, that should, will have to be requalified. Hospice care is given to someone who already made a decision that there's no more aggressive treatment. A choice. A choice already. It's a choice. It's not a place to dump you like you're dying. <laughs> it's, 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 a, uh, it's a symbol of your choice, no more treatment. So you should look at that as a, you know, as a, as a, uh, no. Perspective. As so a it's perspective. Really, it's really more a, a philosophy, yes. right? That as a patient, one can choose not to have treatment and to go for quality of life. Is Precisely. That okay. Precisely. All right. So we have debunked two myths on palliative care. It is not for the dying. Palliative care doesn't equal hospice. No? So we just want to make that very, very clear. Now, let's start with our informative discussion. What does palliative care really mean? I mean, what is the scope? How does it become a beacon of support for cancer warriors? If you're going to, again, we go to the definition. It's the palliative care, the purpose is to enhance quality of life of a patient who had been diagnosed to have life-limiting illness. In that case, the question, to, the, the, what should be answered is, what are the domains of quality of life? Yes. And what are the domains? One is physical, psychological, spiritual, social and lately uh, to enhance quality of life it's on the internal environment wow. where the patient is is uh, living. usually yeah. living okay so if it's personal that's where medicine comes in the doctors a lot of doctors are being trained too so that's about symptom management and so symptom management about uh, pain, pain fatigue Dysnea, breathlessness, edema, you know, lymphedema, wound, um, oral sores, etc., etc. But of course, also in the physical aspect that many are forgetting, even a lot of training in, uh, abroad, which has to be corrected, is also the nutritional aspect of the physical body. Wow. Right? Because uh, there's always the need of them to be nourished. But of course, there are certain principles of when and when to withhold those type of nutrition for a patient. Sure. The second is psychological. Okay. Psychological, so there are uh, physical support by a lot of the field of medicine. And there's also the psychological support. When a patient is diagnosed with a life-limiting illness and cancer, it's very natural for the patient to to grieve, yes. to be depressed, yes. etc. So, what is the way to support that? First and foremost is the single most important tool that all healthcare givers, doctors or not, should possess. And that is what I call communication therapy. 
right? So that's, that's important and provide the patient with accompaniment at that instant when the patient suddenly realizes, oh my God, I have a life-limiting illness, Psycho psychological. Third is the spiritual. So the spiritual, when a person is facing, is facing something like a life-limiting illness or death or has to come to terms to mortality, what shall we be doing? Yeah. Unfortunately, this is becoming a support care, which I strongly disagree, especially for Filipinos. Spiritual care should be at the core yes. of care for patients. Or at the forefront. <laughs> or at the forefront, right? Because you're only already talking about existential issues. Yes. So what am I talking about existential issues? These are issues that you face. Why did I have this disease? Why me? Why me? Yeah. Uh, how about my family? What does it mean? Why should I suffer? Do I deserve this? Do I deserve this? What is now my... What is, where am I now in this world? Yeah. I am soon going to live. How about my family? Yeah. Have I done anything wrong? What will happen to my spirit? That should be answered. Unfortunately, many, and we still have a lot of to do, if a person is given palliative care, or... It, to go a palliative care, why are we talking about preparation for death? Yes, I agree. <laughs> right? What is wrong in preparing for death and yeah. getting ready? Yeah. So that's the third part. And then there's social. Yeah. Social issue is when a patient is facing mortality, the relationship sad dynamic suddenly changes. changes with your doctor, with your friends with and your family, yeah, with your family. husband or your wife and your caregiver. Yeah. So those have to be addressed, those, those things. And also importantly in, in, in the social aspect of palliative care is the financial aspect. It's very expensive. Medicines are very expensive. But palliative care need not be expensive. I agree. Right? Absolutely. So financial aspect, that's why... Part of palliative care, and this is my philosophy, is there should be financial literacy on everyone. I share the same <laughs> principle that when a patient undergoes any type of treatment, it has to be a treatment that is sustainable, right? Agreed. Because you don't want to spend like half a million pesos and then you can only do it for a month. Right? So very important. So we actually have somehow um, really broken down that thinking that palliative care is reduced to pain management. That is the experience here in the Philippines. I mean, mm -hmm. I can speak from, from my own experience based on the cancer patients I've held space for. So what Dr. Eves has really described to us is that palliative care is holistic care. Okay, holistic. And with your description, am I right in saying that then when you do palliative care, it involves more than just your medical... Um, Competency. Theme. Yes. There has to be a bigger yes. team that will have to implement the total palliative care approach. Um, yes, the, the approach should be holistic. And the, the, there are the various dimensions that have to be addressed. With the current system to which palliative care developed, and unfortunately it's always Western, so there seems to be a specialization for the physical, the spiritual, the psychological, and that's why there are the social services, there is the chaplain or a pastoral care provider, then there is the psycho, clinical psychologist or psychiatrist. And then there's the doctor. The doctor serves as the team leader. Okay. So that's how it is now being practiced. Okay. So it's a whole team. It's a team. Yeah. So changing the narrative now, how can we redefine palliative care to make it more accessible and less intimidating for our Patients who have been diagnosed with not just cancer, but as you said, life-limiting illnesses. What should be the narrative to make it less more intimidating? 
Well, um, there's a lot to change in the way we're doing palliative care. Because the outcome of palliative care is not really just to remove the symptoms or palliate that or improve quality of life. My, my feeling is it's all about the towards the direction of healing. When I say healing, it's, not, it's a nuanced word. It, it's not just a matter of uh, restoring to the, to the status, to the original. Mm -hmm. It is not just a matter of, of uh, having normal life again. Because it's like the pandemic, there's a new normal. <laughs> You underwent all those changes and all those trauma among people. That's why we have to have, live with the new normal, yeah. right? And that is what should be the case for patients with, with life-limiting illness. It's, it's dealing with what is happening, what will happen, happen, and therefore you deal with it. It's healing. And when I say healing, considering all the various domains, what can be restored? It, can you restore the physical? Not necessarily. Can you restore the psychological aspect? Probably. The spiritual? Probably should be. Right? And the social. So it's, it has to be towards healing. Whether ultimately the patient dies or, or the family will have to be bereavement. So the, the planning, the communication, the teamwork will have to be towards healing. It doesn't end with just the quality of life of patient has been enhanced. It has to go forward. So, so the output is now widened. Precisely. It's not just curative, but it's really overall healing from all the different domains that you mentioned. Yes. It's because it might not be any more possible, as you said, that uh, physical restoration will go back to um, the original state of the body. But the, you mentioned something really, really thought-provoking. And that is accept the new normal. Be able to live with the disease, but not necessarily um, sacrifice the quality of life. Precisely. Okay. And uh, if I may add, um, in, 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 in palliative care and also in healing, uh, it's not always, as I've told you, it's not always possible to go back to normal. But the team has a very important role in that, and that is communication and education with sensitivity to culture and, and beliefs and values. That's very important. I That's think. very important. Because That's, communication yeah. is the single most important tool that we can do and used to heal a patient. Yeah. A lot of times, we are faced with a situation where nobody wants to talk to the patient about what he or she is really going to be up against. Right? So parang, we wait for the time when the patient almost feels it, that, that life is deteriorating before communication actually happens. And this is what I always say, if you are... If you've just tuned in or if you've just opened your YouTube, we're talking about palliative care. And a lot of times, they don't even want to talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, interesting, interesting topic. So let's hear from your heart. <laughs> How have patients experienced palliative care and what transformations have you witnessed? I have a favorite story that you shared with me before, and I think it was pretty moving. This was about a woman and the two sons who were taking care of her. Would you care to share that? Because I think that is a very... Is that clear about the music and the... Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Okay. I was working in a transit care unit in charge of nutritional management of the patient. That one night, there was a new patient at the end of the hall that we heard singing, beautiful voice. So we went there and we saw the son doing some portable organ, etc. And all of us, it's like a Christmas 
it's not really a Christmas song, but we were led to it and listen to her. So we were all there gathering. Of course, with all our masks because it's still pandemic. And I said, oh my God, I have to interview this guy later. So when she finished, she, she slept. Okay. And I could, I'm restless. I have to know what's happening. So I interviewed the guy. And this guy turned out to be the son. And I said, your mom has a very good voice. And I already know the diagnosis. So she's leaving the world soon. I said, wow, what is she? What is she? Oh, she's my, I know, she's my mom. And she used to be a, a church singer. Wow. Oh my God, is she happy? Yeah. How about you? Well, you know the feeling, etc. And so what happened was, the following day, it's not the same guy. It's another guy. As it turned out, it's the brother. Mm. And I said, where's that? Oh, it's my brother. We're making turns to care for our mother. Wow. Oh, sad. okay. So sad. I told myself, this institution is supposed to be, most of the time, you don't see their parents or their family because so restricted. But in this case, there's always somebody from the family entering. I said, such wonderful dynamics. What happened to her? She's dying, and it seems that uh, we'll be losing her. She's our, I know. But it's okay. She's prepared. Wow, that's a beautiful story. But she's prepared. Oh, my <coughs> God. How do you, in myself, I said, how do you prepare? And I had a conversation, luckily, with her. And then when I was sitting with her, I was serving the food. I said, Mom, how are you? I'm okay. Mom, we have such beautiful voice. Oh, it's, it's really like that when you, have, when you are in, with me and you are in this condition. You go back to what loves you most because it's the one that, get, that gives you serenity. I said, okay, that's a lesson learned for me. So what, shall, what serenity will give to my patient? And then I said, you must have, have a happy life. I have, but it doesn't mean that there were no challenges. But we st stick with each other. And that's what I'm going to bring along. Oh my God, I almost cried. Because there she said to us that it is the most important thing is love. And that's what I can bring when I go out of this world. I almost cried. Even now I feel, I can still feel the, her words. Actually, she passed away a uh, few days later. So this is really palliative care in action. It's not just about pain management. It's really about nurturing the person, really being able to hold space for the person, especially on the spiritual, emotional, and the mental aspect. So let's now focus on the community. How can we, as a community, nurture conversations that brings compassion to the forefront? As we said, it's not something that we talk about. Um, how can communities now play a role in really being able to bring the palliative care at the forefront of discussions? That's a very nice question. It's something I, I wish we can improve. You see, when you care for the dying, the burden is so much, especially for the directly, directly to the caregiver. Whoever gives the care, whether it is paid or not paid, informal or not, the burden is too much. The, the burden in the sense you are inside the room 24 hours, small problem you have to address. Yeah. You need some relief. That is why there should be what we call respite care yeah, hey. for the caregivers. <laughs> yeah. And that's where the, the community comes in. So I'm glad he, I'm here in the Philippines. Uh, I wish we have a respite care coming from the volunteers in the church. Because these volunteers in the church, I'm pretty sure they need rest to compassion. Yeah. They mm -hmm. have the spirituality that they can always share. Yeah. And they are really volunteers. So if we can organize the community towards providing respite care, for the death and the, for the dying, and especially for the caregivers, that will be an excellent arrangement. That is really a, a philosophy that we also highly support. 
being able to give time off for the love givers so they can also take care of themselves. As we always say, you know, when we take care of ourselves as love givers, we can offer better patient care. So there's a lot of misconceptions. How can we shift societal perceptions of palliative care from being solely associated with end-of-life pain management approach throughout the cancer journey. As, as you mentioned, it's not just in the Philippines, but also in other countries, there's a gap that we need to close. Yes, There's that's a lot true. of shifts that need to happen. Well, in the first place, you know, it's not only here. I'm telling you, in other countries, even the United States, you will be shocked that a patient for palliative care is being referred 13 weeks before the patient dies. Wow. That's so unfair. One, we should, I think the most important thing is really education and instruction. And these uh, this programs like this will start the ball rolling. Yeah. Because there's really a lot to, to learn about it. And so education will really play an important role. But not the formal education, what they th think of. Conversations like this will have a lot of impact. And it should be taught in a way that is very positive, uplifting, yeah. not it's dreadful. Yeah. And people, we should start talking about death because it's inevitable. Death in a way that is not so morbid. How to do it, I'm not yet sure, but we have to start talking about it. Now you know why Doc Eves and I are friends because we <laughs> are really proponents that we take off the glass ceiling and really start having this hard conversations mm -hmm. around death and dying. So communication and education on the part of the medical team, communication and education for the family and for the patient cool. and the surrounding support, right? So why is integrating palliative care early in the cancer care important? You already said it's unfair you know, to, to introduce palliative care towards the end. Why is it important? Okay. Let me start with the that statement of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I think it was in 2017, if my memory serves me right. Any uh, cancer patients diagnosed with advanced to metastatic disease should receive palliative care no later than eight weeks. Wow since the di diagnosis. Wow. <laughs> and I, I strongly agree with that. Why is that so? Again, there's another misconception that if a patient is given palliative care, it's because there's no more treatment for the tumor or the cancer itself. Wrong. There are two things that you are caring for the patient. The tumor burden itself and the human being. Yes. So if you're going to draw an, a rectangle, and create a diagonal line, the, the one with its uh, taller height and then the triangle reaches its apex, that's the treatment of the tumor. That's the conventional chemotherapy, biological therapy. Radiation, and then, yeah. And, and then as you grow that, that's where palliative care is. And then you can create a triangle here. This is the bereavement support for the family. So it has to start early. Because if you don't, because from the start early, you can already make education. When a patient is talk about cancer, ang daming block niyan sa reception ng sinasabi mo. Kasi the patient is still processing, oh my God, I'm dying. So, ang kanil tanong sabihin mo, hindi. So, so, ang education niyan sa pasyente, continuous, small bits and pieces, yes. at ano pa yung nararamdaman niya. Agree. Tapos mag educate ka, I'm pretty sure when, a, you know that, you know what's happened. Eh, siyempre, kasama sa education na yan, sa mga pasyent, ay eh, dun sa family, family yeah. at yung mag-aalaga. Yung doktor naman will have to learn on the sensitivities, the beliefs, the values, and traditions of that family and the patient. So, it's a journey. So, there's, there should be, from the start, magsimula na. Kasi mahabang proseso yan. Hindi mo aalamin niya kung kailan mamamatay na ang pasyente. That is why, Pag na-diagnose na yan, mag ka na advanced care planning, gumawa na ng goals of care, which is regularly reviewed and adjust depending on the patient. 
Another thing that you can help, that's why it has to start, palliative care is not an isolated approach. When somebody is dying, there's palliation. Gagawa ka ngayon dyan na mga preventive measures, promotive measures, rehabilitation measures. Makakadikit yan. Kasi, bakit preventive? You don't like the patient to go down the spiral physically, emotionally, financially, etc. So you prevent that. So preventive is not just the traditional way of preventive medicine na hindi makasakit. Hindi. You prevent crisis from happening. So umpisa pa lang dapat may preventive ka na. And that is also the most important time. You know the impact of dying? That's the most important time to promote something. To create a message, we have to take care of health. Don't wait for it to happen. So yung mga yung nagpo-promote ng health, this is one of the best of time of opportunity to create promotive medicine, educational campaign about it. Okay. And then rehabilitation. Ang ibig sabihin ng rehabilitation, may tinatawag na pre-rehabilitation. Even before a patient undergo, for example, mastectomy, there is a there is a practice of prehabilitation wherein the patient and the family are educated of everything from start to the end and set expectations and possibilities True, which is and options, <laughs> which should be the case, yeah. right? In that case, that's, that's really how it should be happening. Yes. So, yun ang dahilan, kailangan sa simula pa lang, umpisa pa lang, Pasok na ang palliative. So there is a lot that needs to be done. That's why we need to, you know, front load the palliative care approach. No? Doc Ibs, how can health professionals effectively communicate without instilling fear, unnecessary fear or anxiety, when it comes to palliative care? Dapat, again, I go back to communication. And dapat pag-aralan, the physician should study what should be said and in should every mention, instant. And I also understand the, the culture of, course, of the family or the You patient. should understand the culture. So, there's a need to, for, the, for the physician to learn more about the patient. And most important, importantly, if it's a communication that is one tool, the word choice and the word order. And the timing. Of course. Yes. The timing should be important if the patient and the family is ready to receive the news Correct. or to receive. I'll give you an example. Ako eh, galit na galit ako kapag nakakarinig ako sa isang medical professional na nagsasabi o magsusumbong ang aking pasyente. Kasi doc, sinabi ng pasyente, I have six months to live. Just ko, kung akong PRC, alisan ko yan ang lisensya. <laughs> you have no right to say that. That is wrong. Nobody knows. Nobody knows and there's a way of saying it. There's a way of saying it depende kung anong diagnosis ng patient. So therefore, bago ka palang mag-break ng news, pag-aralan mo na ang proper way to say it. Tingnan mo kung anong evidence na sinasabi and you say it in a way na hindi nakaka-traumatize sa pasyente. Kasi kung six months and one day na, on that one day, takot-takot na ako, I can die anytime. Hindi pwede ganun. Pag-aaralan mo ang sasabihin mo. Breaking bad news. In fact, in other institutions in the United States, may mga methodology siya yeah. kung paano sasabihin mag-break ng bad news, paano makikipag-usap, may mga, may mga criteria. And we should be doing that. And that's where research come in. I totally agree. You and I share the same advocacy in elevating patient care, especially at the end of life. How important, and you and I love this term, how important is accompaniment? and the role it plays in the palliative care space, accompaniment. Okay. Pag sinabing accompaniment, let's have an analogy. You, we, all ex we all have friends, and all our friends, many times, there are instances where your friends are so down of bad news. What do you do? You listen, you are just there for them, for her, and you have a uh, listening, right? And you try to do the best you can. To support. Yeah. To support. Right? And you can do little things that can be creative that more or less will prevent your friend 
from further going down the drain yeah. emotion-wise. And that's also with palliative care. Kapag na ang pasyente ay na-diagnose na, many times, you know, some doctors would really just give the prescription, etc., i-refer. Kapag ang isang pasyente, kunyari, eh, medyo na-shock na ganon, kailangan mo bang i-refer kagad sa isang psychiatrist or psychologist? Pakinggan mo muna. <laughs> Absorb it first. Give some some accompaniment to the patient. Right? Kasi, yun ang kailangan ng pasyente at that moment. Yeah. At that moment, tulungan mo muna siya doon. This time, it's not about medicine, it's about being human. And so, listen, look at the patient, and see what you can do, just like a friend. And there, are, and of course, kung ikaw ay doktor, alam mo naman siguro sa palliative, alam mo naman siguro yung mga milestones or mga areas where all those crises can happen. And you should have been trained about it, give some company to the patient, na hindi mo kagad i-refer. O kaya naman sa pamilya, give the person some space muna until mahimas-masan and things are cooler. You just stay with them without doing anything. So accompaniment, simply put, is really being present for the patient. Being present at, with the patient at that moment. Yes. Yun lang. Okay. Thank you so much. Building support, what resources or networks exist for cancer warriors seeking palliative care, at least in the Philippine setting? Um, are we, do we have the framework to do it properly? Are, hos are all hospitals equipped to do it? No, um, there are already, there's already a society on palliative medicine. And I think they already have spread their, their trained people around the different countries. Again, to answer that, we should be able to know is palliative care, what are the settings at which we provide palliative care? Kasi ang akala lang ng mga tao, hospice. Hindi. Palliative care is given because it's a journey. It can be not only in the hospice, not only in the home, can be in the hospital, it can be outpatient, yes. or even in a transit care unit. Yes. So kung tatanungin natin, hospice in home, mukhang na-cover na yan ng society. In the hospital, baka meron na rin hospice care area dun sa hospital. Outpatient, I'm not sure. Yeah. Now, ang hospital care usually are given by internist. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if family med who are in the hospice, in the palliative medicine, have, are also practicing there. So, uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether these things are integrated. I had a ch so, isa lang yon sa physical. How about sa spiritual? I had a chance to talk to three priests. I sabi ko sa kanila, Father, bakit ang Catholic Church walang clinical pastoral education? Eh, yung mga Christian ang Catholic, meron pa silang pinag-aaralan. Bakit hindi nyo gawin? Paray ko, di ba? Apparently, it's a matter of talking to them. Okay. So, uh, wala pa ang Catholic. Eh, the Philippines is majority Catholic. Yeah. Mukhang walang clinical pastoral education from the lens of the Catholic religion. Uh, naka, I'm still waiting with my own initiative the, the, the secretary of the bishop fold, called me three weeks ago and asking me, Doctor, are you, still, are you still interested to pursue your clinical pastoral education? Yes, sabi ko kanyan. Uh, when will it start? Second week of December. So I uh, had December 8th. And what's now? So many days. You know what I did every day? Uh, this is a gentle follow-up from a gentle <laughs> pastoral education. When will I start? Wow. So, sa ganon, kulang. Clinical, uh, psycho, marami tayo. Yeah. Psychologists, etc. Social service, mukhang maayos tayo. Yeah. So, parang ang, ano ko na lang yung sa spiritual, 
At saka hindi ko alam yung mga infrastructure yeah. support sa, think, yeah. at across various settings. So I think there's a lot that needs there's to There's still done. a lot to do. Okay. Okay. Empowering our listeners, how can they initiate conversations about palliative care in their own circle? Um, I think we have cancer support communities and we can start in injecting yes. that, right? The support, the cancer support initiative should really be disseminated. Because that's the way to to have a conversation to have about this the conversation issues. Conversation rolling. Um, Doc Ibs, could you please share with us programs and initi- initiatives that you have, you know, in the pipeline, which you already mentioned, um, in terms of really improving better patient care. Okay, um, in improving patient care. I'm always guided by the the domains of quality of life. I don't think there's an issue on improving on the symptom management. As an internist, we should be able to handle that. Of course, we need more confidence in pain management of the patient because it's one of the more challenging. Usually, ang nangyayari kasi, we immediately refer to anesthesia. Yeah. I realized in my fellowship in palliative medicine, 80 to 90% are relieved by just the following the WHO analgesic ladder, la, the ladder, ladder for pain. And I said, oh my God, I, I have to learn more about looking back. So I think that's the only one that I have to. And there are a lot of advances in medicine, even on palliative therapy. I don't like to say it chemo, but I like to say palliative therapy. Because, of course, the advances now, are there are more drugs now that are friendly, less, Friendlier to le- the yes, less, less side effects compared to the traditional chemotherapy. That there are have. targeted. Yes, they are targeted, now. they are monoclonals, etc. Number two, for getting sa spiritual, maraming dapat kailangan, hindi pa yata nasisimulan. Kasi kawawa naman yung mga pastor sa simbahan, pagod na yan, ang dami nilang inaano. At saka kailangan nilang ma-relate yung kanilang conversation doon sa sakit sa pasyente. That's why kailangan there's a merger of the clinical and the pastoral Agreed. aspect. Agreed. Ngayon, pagdating naman sa, psycholo- sa accompaniment, like psychological, maraming mga instruments na na-develop abroad. To, uh, kunyari, ang isa sa issue ng mga tao ay body image. Pag ikaw eh nakaroon ng mastectomy, body image yun yung scar na yan, at saka you're being woman. Nandyan din yung mga mamagato, Yung, bad, yung weight loss, weight gain. Kaya so, English. So I'm trying to look if there are validated instruments that is culturally fit into the Philippine setting. Correct. Even, so those instruments will have to be validated. I don't like to use it if it's not validated. Ako pa naman sa evidence-based, which is an epidemiology domain. Kailangan mo validate yan for the local setting and the other languages, Buano, Ilocano, etc., Kasi ang isang pasyente na, na may ganyang problema, go back to the foundation. Ang foundation yan, ang natural language yan, yung kung saan siya pinanganak. Yeah. So therefore, those instruments will have to be translated. Hindi lang sa Tagalog, sa Cebuano and everything. There's a lot to do there. <laughs> yung palang. And many others. There's still a lot. I do have projects now that I have started with... with uh, English Filipino translation kasi ang kaya ko lang Pilipino. We're doing some translation with some fellows in a major government hospital. We're starting it and then hopefully eh maging successful para yung mga nasa ibang provinces eh mag-translate na rin kasi magagamit siya ng mga doktor sa diagnostic part ng pag-aalaga ng pasyente. So yun, yun ang mga isa sa mga ano ko. Okay. And many others. They also want uh, financial literacy. So, marami dito magaling sa financial planning, financial analysis. Pwede ba, let's put some effort to design these courses for patients in palliative care. Turuan ng doktor, turuan ng pamilya. Yes. So, that's also one of the things I'm thinking about. Naku, Yung mga kulang. It seems like you're gonna be very, very busy. <laughs> now, as we conclude this compassionate conversation, may it be a catalyst for change? the change that you and I have been dreaming of for, for the country. So thank you, Dr. Ibs, for sharing your insights. And to our viewers, keep those conversations flowing. And until the next time 
on the Life Doula podcast. Stay care and spread the compassion. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's Thank my you. privilege. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.